This confluence of the mythological and the pathological, the gods and diseases. Already in 1900, Wilhelm Heinrich Roscher's monograph on Ephialtes, subtitled a, a pathologic, subtitled a pathological mythological treatise, interiorized Pan into our nightmares. Concurrent with Rocher, Freud interiorized Oedipus from a theatrical figure we may watch on the stage to a drive in your personal intimate body. As well, Freud elevated the mythical personifications Eros and Thanatos to be the dominant gods of all psychological happenings. It is fashionable today to bypass or surpass Freud for all sorts of reasons, sociological, feminist, scientistic. But one gift from Freud we ought never neglect, his return to the sources of culture in Mediterranean myths rooting psychology not in the brain or genetics or blind evolution, but in the poetic basis of mind, whose imagination is structured by mythical configurations or universali fantastici, as Vico called these archetypal presences. The recognition of the intimate and subtly differentiated connection between myths and pain, between the gods and diseases and politics, is the greatest of all achievements of the Greek mind, singling out that culture from all others, despite its flaws, its faults. That achievement, the Greek perfection of tragedy, which demonstrates directly the mythic governance of human affairs within states, within families, within individuals. Only the Greeks could articulate tragedy to this pitch, and that achievement has not been equaled since. In the Greek sense, we are today in just such a tragedy as Thebes under Oedipus Tyrannos. The king is sick, and in the madness of his sickness, in his profound unconsciousness, the tragedy of the nation lies. Its poverty, its wasted youth, the degeneration of its crops and soil, its water and forests. This was the condition of Thebes at the beginning of Sophocles' first Oedipus play. I quote, the city wastes in blight, Blight on the earth's fruitful blooms and grazing flocks and on the barren birth pangs of the women, the fever god has fallen on the city and drives it. The fever god in our case today is the same as the one named by Sophocles, line 1911, the fever of the god of war, Ares. And all this because the king is blind to his own nature. In other words, the facts of our collective condi condition must be laid upon the king, as Henry V reluctantly, ambiguously says, upon the king, our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. I do not want to overlook the fact that the psychological method I am pursuing, following from Jung and from Campbell, give scant attention to the historical time frame of the myths, their geographical locations, to the philological analysis of the texts where they are recounted, to the authenticity of their transmission, to the disputed evidence from archeology, span to their sociological and political contexts. In other words, the psychological method I am advancing is shamefacedly syncretistic and may offend the patient devotion to scholarly research by those who come at the same tales with different intentions. To uncover ancient myths and behavior in the phenomena we are unthinkingly absorb as usual reality and utterly unmythical, that is the revelation an archetypal psychology seeks. We ravage the scholarship of others and pilfer whatever we can justifying these violations in the name of bringing deeper understanding to psychological afflictions. 
our method does cast a shadow, a major shadow that wears the bright smile of the new age, its innocent optimism. Besides, our aim of tying a humanness, a human mess to a wider myth, we are also attempting to connect present experience to historical culture, something sadly lacking all through the culture today hoping to open a long closed door bolted from two sides, history and its scholarship bearing witness only to the dead, the past and gone, and psychology utterly contained within the subjective soul, painfully present and personal. Jung and Campbell and those of us here who work in this tradition attempt to show how Western antiquity can be relevant to the life of the psyche and how psychic life can vivify Western antiquity. When scholars speak only to documents and psychologists only to patients, culture languishes, its soul shallow and unrooted in historical knowledge and its knowledge without soul. Let's go back to 42nd Street. Ain't she sweet, walking down the street. Behavior, action, myth, as it moves along, unspoken. Remember, the very essence of the word myth is cognate with mien, closed as mystery, as the eyelid closes, and simple expletives like mu, Greek for alas, Sanskrit, muka, dumb including also etymological connotations such as mute, mum, mumble, mutter. When we speak myth, we really are not speaking myth, but mythology, the logos or telling of myth, for myth is action, or as some theories say, myth follows from ritual or is embodied in ritual. Moreover, myth gives the certitude of action, such as we easily recognize when possessed by the goddess of sexual love or blinded with martial fever. Just this very idea that myth gives the certitude of action is made clearer by the work of Vico, that extraordinary man and one of my dearest heroes who lived and worked in Naples in the early half of the 18th century and maybe it was the fall he suffered at age of seven that cracked his head open and kept him from school for three years that freed him from the science of the time and its education and its ideas of truth. Freed him from Newton and Descartes and Galileo and allowed him to found the mind in myth and lay out an, another idea of certitude versus truth. Certitude is the concrete engagement with life and it precedes all the principles and theories and interpretations or the truth that we